Good morning. Blessings to you. Good morning, Vermel and Arinda. Come on in. Koshan, you're right. Good morning to you. Sandra Davis. Oh, my goodness. Good morning to all of you, Latanis and Laquanda. Hello, my former student, Aaron. I taught him when he was in the ugh, second grade. He's a grown man now. Uh, Linda Davis, good morning. Javen Richardson, good morning to you. I pray that uh, everyone is doing well on this Lord's Day Sunday morning. Oh my goodness, what a delight it is to be alive in the kingdom of God. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege to be alive in the kingdom of God. Don't take you don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted. Uh, Denise and Kenneth and Vanessa. Listen, you already know what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to connect four. That means tag three people and share. Oh, you know that there is something that God wants to say to us uh, on this morning. So uh, in addition, grab those Bibles. We're going to be going back and forth this morning. So I want you to be able to see what the Lord is saying. My sister, Kristen, good morning, uh, Janet and Dolores. Oh, it is a pleasure to have all of you on on this morning. Good to see you, Danita and, and Tanya. Go ahead and let's go to the New Testament book of first Corinthians, the Lord won't let me leave the new Testament, uh, but it's okay because our information, uh, in the new Testament comes from the old Testament in in great deal of cases. So it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to hear what the spirit is saying to the church, to the church, to the body of Christ. And that's exactly who we are. Great, Kayana. I'm glad that you have the word. Make sure that you're sharing. Make sure that you are sharing. We're just going to take a, just one more moment. Hope that you all had a great week. I hope that you had a great week. First uh, Corinthians chapter six, first Corinthians chapter six. And let's look at verse 19, verse 19. Good morning, Amanda. I'm reading for the King James Version. What? That's what the text says. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I can't leave it alone. I have to read that again. What? If you're looking at the text, you know that I'm saying what for a reason. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own. I, I want to talk, share, or teach, and I think this is going to be a two-parter. Uh, I, I want to teach from this, uh, uh, this thought. If God lives here, if God lives here. I want to preface this message this morning with this interrogative. Uh, do you believe in God? What are you talking about, Sherita? No, 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 no. That's a real question that I really want you to answer. I want you to ponder it. I want you to deconstruct and examine everything that you have been taught. I want to know this morning, and you don't have to answer it in the comments. I want you to answer it in your spirit. Do you believe in God? I know that we were taught 
to believe in God. I know that we were sent to church and we were sent to Sunday school and, and we were uh, made to learn the books of the Bible. But I'm asking you today, do you really believe that there is a God? Because that is going to be the basis of our lesson this morning. Because if you believe in God, and if you know that there is a God, then there are certain things that should be in place in, in, in our lives. So let's talk about Corinthians. That, that's just the setup. Let's talk about Corinthians. Uh, Corinthians uh, is a church that is founded by Paul. Okay, we've talked about Paul a lot these last few weeks, but this happens to be a church that Paul does found. Okay. He establishes this church. And at the time of this writing, they are what we would consider an adolescent church. They're not babes in Christ. They, 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 they know of uh, Jesus Christ. They, they've heard about the resurrection. Um, Paul has given them great instruction. Okay. Um, the, the, the city of Corinth is very important as it relates to this particular letter. Good morning to all of you that are coming on. I love the hearts. Uh, uh, the, the, the location of this text is very, very important to us because if you understand Corinth, it was located on what we consider an isthmus, all right? It was a place that was a port city. It was, a, it was an important city in the ancient Greek world, okay? Now, any trade that came um, came into the ancient Greek world, came through um, Corinth. Stay with me. I promise you this is going to make good sense, okay? So it, it was a, a Roman province. It was a place where trade would come in. And you all know that anytime ships are coming in, anytime there's export, it's an export city. You had a lot of things that were going on in that city. Some would even call it um, a, a little Las Vegas, okay? Um, because there were a lot of things. When you, whenever you've got people coming in a city and out of city, when it's a trade city, you've got different people coming in. And housed here in this city is this church, all right? It is this church, all right? Now, the letter that Paul writes is a correspondence uh, or, or a reply to, to letters and correspondences that he receives from the house of Chloe. I'm in chapter one of first Corinthians. All right. He he's receiving information. I'm in chapter one, verse 11. All right. There, there, there has been declared unto me that, um, from the people of the house of Chloe, we don't know who Chloe is. She's a, she's a woman. We know that. Uh, we don't know if it's, um, people in the church. We don't know if it's her cousins, but we know that somebody has gotten in touch with Paul about contentions in the church. I'm sorry, um, Nikki, we are in first Corinthians chapter six, verse uh, 19 and 20. All right. So there are many issues that Paul has to address in this letter to this church. Oh, my goodness. I would encourage you to go and read it. Oh, we've got problems uh, such as people saying, oh, um, I am the apostle uh, or I'm of the people of Paul. People preferring um, different apostles. Oh, I I'm, I'm of Apollos and I'm of Cephas. A Cephas, you know, interpreted to be Peter. And, and some would say, oh, no, I'm of Christ. So he has to address the fact that there's some people who have connected with different apostles. Not only does he address that, but he has to address um, sexual content and sexual conduct in this book. I'm telling you, you know, this is a, the best novel you'll ever read. He's, 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 he's talking about marriage and divorce. He's talking about people who um, are eating food that have been offered to idols. He's talking about a whole lot of things. Okay. And so when Paul is writing to this church, he has to address these things because they are going on. A lot of what he was talking about was fornication. Again, sexual conduct. I won't get into that. All right. Because we all know what is right. 
what is wrong. We know that sex in of, it, of itself is God's way of producing um, what his commandment was to us in the garden to be fruitful and multiply. So sex in of itself is not a bad thing. All right. But you got to understand that anything that is done outside of the will of God presents a problem. And so Paul addresses this. So he says, I want you to, 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 to I want to ask you a question. He says, no, you're not. Listen, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, I cannot take for granted that you are like the church in Corinth who has some understanding of the temple. To understand the temple, we've got to go back to the Old Testament. Y'all need y'all to help me preach this morning. We've got to go back to the Old Testament. The word temple means sanctuary. Where do we first find the sanctuary or the house of God? I'm glad you asked. I want you to put in the comments Exodus chapter 25. I told you, we're, I'm teaching you. I'm teaching you. I have to teach you. All right. It is in Exodus 25 where the Lord speaks to Moses. He speaks to Moses about building him a tabernacle in the wilderness. Oh, my God. I'm telling you, if you follow me, then you already know where I'm going. All right. The children of Israel have been released from out of Egyptian captivity, and now they are in the wilderness. And God says to Moses, listen, I want you to have the people to bring me all types of offerings. I want them to bring me blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. I want you to, 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 to have them to bring light and spices. I, I, what, what, G, what God is essentially doing is giving um, Moses the construct for the tabernacle. Oh my God. Yes. The temple is the tabernacle. He's, he's giving them or giving uh, Moses the construct for the tabernacle, for the sanctuary, the place that God dwelled. This is nothing new. This is nothing new to the people in Corinth. They knew that there was a portable temple, a portable house of God that was in the wilderness. Now, we, we've got to talk about this. And I'm telling you, I don't know if I'm going to have to do a study on the tabernacle or not, but I believe that I am going to have to do that. Okay? The temple, the, 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 the tabernacle of God, the tabernacle of God was a portable sanctuary. It was a portable sanctuary um, that uh, had to be put up and taken down, put up and taken down. And certainly I don't have the time to go through all of the elements in the tabernacle. Again, that is, that is a 10 part series. And if you push me, I'll make it happen for you. But when you understand the tabernacle, you understand that there were three compartments, three places in the tabernacle. You had the outer court. The outer court was the place where really Thank you, Pastor Dion Clark, my dear friend from um, Greensboro. The, the, the outer court was a place where um, many people could come in. Okay, you would you would make the sacrifices um, there in the outer court. Um, it wasn't, you know, largely exclusive. You had people coming in and out of the outer court again to make sacrifices. But then there was a place that if we go further into that structure and further into that construct, you would find there that there was the sanctuary proper or the inner court. Are you with me? If you're with me, say you're with me. All right. The inner court, that was the place where the priests could go in. All right. You had the, the altar, the altar of incense. You had the menorah. You had the table of showbread where they would change the bread out on a weekly basis. OK, so there, there was a limit to the people that could get into the inner court. Oh, my God, I'm giving you a quick, quick construct. But then there was what we would call the inter sanctum. 
Oh my God. It was the most holy place. It was the place that housed, uh, the, the, it housed God. It housed the Ark of the Covenant. Are you with me? I'm going so fast. It was the place that housed the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark of the Covenant were uh, the, the two tablets of stone, the, the Ten Commandments. It was uh, Aaron's rod that budded, and it also had some manna uh, that was from the wilderness. Okay, But in that place was the Ark of the Covenant, and it is said that the presence of God was in that inner chamber. And only, listen, only the high priest could go in. You couldn't just walk in there just because you decided you're going into the holy place. No, only the high priests were allowed into that inner chamber, the most holy place. They would go in there once a year on the day of atonement or Yom Kippur, and they would make oblations and sacrifice for the people there. That is important. That is important because God, when God's presence was there, it would usually be in the form of a cloud. There would be some times where the presence of God would be so strong that those who were in the temple or those who were in the tabernacle to minister, when I say minister, that means to take care of the place, to take care, to make sure that the, the showbread was in, uh, changed. They wouldn't be able to minister. They wouldn't be able to sweep. They wouldn't be able to make sure that the curtain and the veil was. No, because the presence of God was so thick. Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? So what are you saying? That the presence of God was present in the Old Testament. And everybody could not have ex access to the presence of God. That's why I ask you, do you believe in God? Do you believe in the presence of God? Do you believe in the power of God? Do you believe in the demonstration of God? Do you believe in the manifestation of God? Because if you do, Paul says that the temple that was put up and taken down in the wilderness, that no longer is there. But he says, I want you to understand that your body now is the temple. It took me a long time to get there, didn't it? But I had to take you there. You have to understand the language of this text. You have to understand what these people are saying. He didn't just say, oh, he's your temple for no reason. He's saying that where, what, what, where Jesus or where God dwelled in between the cherubims, now that same power is present in your body. This is deep. This is some deep stuff. I'm telling you, I can't even really articulate it the way that God is downloading it in my spirit. He says, I want you to know he's talking to this Corinthian church that has been exposed to so much debauchery, who has been exposed uh, uh, to, to prostitutes standing um, uh, on, on the corner waiting for the sailors to come in. He says, I want you to understand in matters that you have wrote me about. He says, I want you to understand that your body is the temple. If you believe in God, you've got to believe this. You've got to believe that right now where you sit, right now where you are relaxed, that God dwells in you. Just give me a moment to process, process this. He says, God dwells in you. The spirit of God well, I want you to touch yourself and say the spirit of God dwells in me. I want you to really, I want you to really mean it. I want you to really mean it. The spirit of God dwells in me. No, say it again. The spirit of God dwells in me. I am the sacred space. I am the place that God chooses to abide. Now, we got to talk about this 
because the whole the, the holy place or the place that God dwelled um was considered holy. Again, you just could not just walk in there presumptuously. You you could not just say today, oh, I'm going to go visit God. No, 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 no. There were some rituals that had to take place. Now, when we understand the concept of holy, you got to understand the concept of holy. Holy um, is not what we consider holy as we know it, as we were taught. You know, we were taught, you know, in order to be holy or walk in holiness, you had to have on a long skirt. You had to have, uh, you, you, oh, I would really be um, not considered holy with these red nails. Um, you, you wouldn't be considered holy, um, you know, with, with your hair uh, uh, unbraided or cut. No, 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 no. That's good. Those were practices that were set in place by different uh, reformations and churches. But holy really, really means um, separate. OK, when we look at um, the, the concept of holy versus profane, we understand that holy simply means set apart or separate profane. The word profane in and of itself does not mean devilish or demonic. We don't demonize that which is profane. No, profane simply means common. I'm teaching. I'm teaching you this morning. Profane means common. So, so when I look at this cup, all right, when I look at this cup, unless it has gone through a process of sanctification, a process where sacrifices has been made to it, it is just, it's considered profane. It's common. All right. Are you with me? So when we look at holy what we are suggesting is that there has been a process of sanctification that causes something or one to be holy. And I want to tell you this, that the only person is holy that is holy is God. I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in trouble right there because, you know, we think that, you know, if we didn't sin today, we're considered holy. I want you to know that the only thing that makes you holy is the God that dwells in you. You're not holy. I, I hate to burst your bubble, but you're not holy. You can't make yourself holy. You, you don't have the power to change yourself. You don't have the power to change your mindset. He says, he says, you're, you're, you're holy. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Why? How am I holy? I'm holy because I have invited the spirit of God in me. So that breaks down the self-righteous spirits. That breaks down this people who say, oh, you know, uh, I can't get with uh, other people because, you know, I'm just holy. Okay, that's great. That's great. But you've got to recognize that the only thing that makes you holy is the presence of God that dwells on the inside of you. Are you listening to me? Only God is intrinsically holy. Only God can make you holy. Only God can sanctify you. You can't sanctify yourself. So the closer, when we look at the tabernacle, the closer we get to the presence of God, the more sacrifice has to be made. Common people can't go into the presence of God. Holiness increases as your proximity to God increases. That, 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 that's why, that's why, you know, you, you got to be careful what you allow on the inside of you. Listen to me. You've got to be careful. Paul says you are surrounded. In Corinth, you are surrounded 
with things that will defile your body. He says, but I want you to understand. Listen to this question. He says, I want you, you, I want you to out ask yourself, don't you know that your body is the temple? And if your body is the temple, if God lives here, listen to me. If God, if God lives in my sanctuary, if God is here in my house, in my body, yes, Koshanya, then there are some things that we've got to look at. There's some things we've got to examine about ourselves. Because for years we thought that only the presence of God was at the church house. We, 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 we weren't taught that what we eat affects the God in us. Oh no. We were never taught that. We were taught, we want you, you if you're going to do something, you better make sure that the pastor doesn't find out. Oh, we're scared of the pastor. Oh, we're scared of the church mother. Oh, we don't want anybody. Oh, we'll do what we want to do. Listen, but as long as the church people don't find out, then it's okay. For years, we were taught. We were given this mindset that, my God, I can't let the church folk find out what I'm, what I'm doing. But Paul says, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committed fornications sinneth against his own body. That's just one thing that he's talking about. Oh, my God. It's not about the skirts. It's not about the earrings. It's not about the fingernails. Paul says, don't you know that your body, this, that there's a certain consciousness that Paul is pushing us to. There's a certain level of awareness that God is pushing us to, or that Paul is pushing us to. We're not living a sanctified life, a life committed to holiness just because we want to impress the clergy. You, you, you shouldn't, you should not decide, okay, I'm going to live holy today because I want to be ordained this year. Choosing to avoid adultery and avoid drunkenness because I'm afraid of being on the block. I'm not choosing to abstain from things that vile or violate my temple because I'm afraid that someone won't be able to receive from me. No, Paul says to the people. I'm telling you to flee fornication. I'm telling you that, that adulterers and the, or the effeminate or abusers of themselves of mankind, these things, you can't enter the kingdom of God. He says, I'm not talking really about that. He says, I'm telling you because your body is the temple. And if God lives here, if God lives here, what, what have you subjected the spirit of God to? What have you allowed in your ear gate and your eye gate and in your spirit and in your heart? What have you subjected the spirit of God to? Because if you believe in God and you believe that God dwells in you, that there, that consciousness has to push you to a level of faithfulness to the way of holiness. What have you subjected the spirit of what have what has the spirit of God watched yesterday? Uh oh. What has the spirit of God had to endure this week? What thoughts have the spirit of God? had to digest this week. 
He says, your body is the sanctuary for the presence of God, the spirit of God. What has the spirit of God said this week through you? Who have you let touch the spirit of God this week? I'm getting ready to go. I, I, I'm not getting a whole lot of likes today. I, I think I'm troubling the people of God. Because the closer you get to God, look at the tabernacle. The closer we get to God, there ought to be a, a greater sacrifice. Now, I'm not talking about people who just want to be common. I'm not talking to people who don't, who, you know, you just want to be a, a common Christian. You're good with the fact that um, you're say No, but he says you're bought with a price. You're not just here by happenstance. God chooses to sit with you, Nikki. Oh, we sing the song, welcome into this place. Welcome into this broken vessel. You desire to abide. We're not talking about the church. We're talking about this church. Is, is, is God, is the spirit of God. You know, there's some people whose houses, you know, I'm very particular about, about particular about where I go. All right. I, I, I just, I'm very particular, um, not just because of cleanness, but, but because of energies, I, 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 I'm, I'm very particular. And, and, and when I, when I go into a home, I told you I'm very observant. Okay. There's some places that I'm like, oh, okay, I can eat from there. And then there's some places I'm like, okay, well give me a to go, um, box. Cause I'm looking at baseboards. I, I'm looking at the sink. I'm looking at all these things because I need to know that whatever that is going to be ingested, whatever I'm going to ingest is going to be clean. Oh my God. Are you listening to me? And if we are, I know that I'm not by myself in that. If we are particular about what we digest, why are we not that particular about our bodies? Because our bodies is the temple. I'm getting ready to close. I'm going to have to come back next week um, and really, really get this out. He says, he's, he says, um, you bought with a price. You house. So, so you house the presence of God. So if God lives here, then I've got to make this thing applicable to my, to my eating habits. I've got to make this thing applicable to my thoughts. If God lives in me, then I have no reason to have low self-esteem. Yes, Cheryl. Exactly. If, 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 if God lives here, then I shouldn't, I shouldn't have a problem with my self-esteem. Oh, I know that we all have some, some weaknesses and some challenges, but when you believe in God and when you believe that God dwells in you, then you've got the presence of God. I shouldn't have to struggle in my mind. If God lives here, then I shouldn't have a inferiority complex. If God lives here, then it's not about the shade of my skin. If God lives here, then I love everything about me. Let's take it this place. Let's take it this way. If God lives here, then I don't have room for cancer. Oh my God. If God lives here, cancer can't live here. And see, I'm closing the book on this because I'm going to have to come back. Are you listening to me? Because that can go both ways. If, if God lives here, then sugar diabetes can't be a part of my construct. And you've got to pray just like that. Oh, when the diagnosis comes in. Oh, okay, God, I got this diagnosis. But your word tells me that my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and the spirit of God dwells in me. So if you're in me, then depression can't live here. 
Oh, you got to turn that thing around on God. I'm telling y'all how to pray. I'm telling you how to pray. If, if God lives here, then heart disease can't stay. If God lives here, COVID-19 can't kill me because I'm so full of God. If God is in me, if God lives here, listen, then blood cancer and leukemia can't stay. If God lives here, depression, I don't have room in my mind because it's full of God. Oh, my God. I'm getting warm now. I said, if God lives here, if the presence of God, if I am the sanctuary that houses the presence of God, then drug use can't live here. Oh, I know. That many of us were exposed to things when we were young. And there's some bad habits that there's no judgment there. There's no judgment there. But when I understand that God is real, I believe in God and I understand that God lives in me. Then that's enough motivation for me to kick that habit. Oh, my God. That ought to be enough motivation for you to stop eating things. You and I that defile our temple all last week, the the Lord gave me this scripture, I believe Monday. And all this week I was saying, Sharita, don't you know that your body is the temple? So when that thought comes in your mind, no, 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 no. Don't you know that your body is the temple? Oh, so when, oh, when I want to get upset, don't, uh, uh, don't you know that your body is the temple? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He says, you're bought with a price. I'm getting ready to close. I'm getting ready to close. You, you're the sanctuary that houses the presence of God. Oh, it was the tabernacle in the Old Testament. But there's no, there's no tabernacle now. Oh, oh, the church, the building has been the place where the presence of God has been. But many of us can't get in there. So what Paul is saying, I've got some information. I've got some information that you all are not understanding this. You all, there was a man in this text, in this um, book. He was in the church, but he was sleeping with his stepmother. Paul says, even the Greeks don't do that. There were, there were men in the church that were sleeping with a prostitutes. He says, if you, when you join yourself with a harlot, you become that. So this is nothing new in the church, but he says, I want you to understand that you're not, not doing this because you're trying to impress me. You're doing, you, you're abstaining from it because your house belongs to God. I, I need somebody just to declare this house belongs to God. 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 In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I want you to know that. I'm not, I'm, it, it doesn't belong to God because I'm perfect. Oh, if you only knew how I have to keep myself on the altar. The only thing that makes me able to go to the throne of grace is the fact that God is in me. Oh, you couldn't go to the throne by yourself. You used to have to have a high priest to do that for you. But that wall of partition has been torn down. And the word of God says you can go boldly to the throne of grace now. But I'm not going boldly to the throne of grace with. You know, we used to equate um, holiness to, to the clothes that we wear in church. We, we've we've kind of gone away from that a little bit now. You can kind of wear what you want to wear, you know. But there's still this thing in me that I just can't wear anything to church because there's a sacredness that I attach to it. And I feel that same way in my spirit. I can't just go to God anyway. I want to sanctify myself before I call on Jesus. 
Before you start asking God for things in prayer, you want to say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. David did it. David says, created me a clean heart. He was, he was an adulterer. He had Uriah killed. I'm going to talk about that one day. He, 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 he had um, a baby that was, that was out of wedlock. But he had enough sense to say, God, don't take your spirit from me. I've made some wrong decisions. I've made some wrong choices. I let my flesh govern my actions. But he had enough understanding and God consciousness to say, whatever you do, don't take your spirit from me. Don't take your spirit from me. God, you can take the throne. You can take the house. You can take the car. You can take the boo. You can take the camel. You can take all of that. But whatever you do, don't take your spirit from me. And we've got to get to that prayer. God, with all that's going on, I need your spirit. We talked about it last week. I need the spirit of God present in me. I'm closing. I want you to know that if, if God lives here, then we have to examine what we subject the presence of God to. Are you listening? If we understand that God lives here, I can't watch everything. I can't listen to everything. I can't let everybody touch me. I can't let different people just decide when they want, want to, you know. No, 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 no. Because my body is the temple. And if you believe in God, and if you believe in the presence of God, then there's some adjustments that we can make to be a better host. Because the thing about a good visitor, when they come to stay in your house, they always leave a great blessing. They always, I'm talking about people with class. They stay in your house, they'll send you something in the mail, or they'll say, thank you for being a great host. And I'm telling you, there's a blessing. There is a blessing connected to how you keep your house. There's a blessing connected to how well you keep your sanctuary. There is a blessing connected to how you walk in the tenets of God and, and how much you sacrifice for the presence of God. Listen, I love you. I love you and thank you for joining me for another edition of Faith Forward. If God lives here that I'm telling you, we have everything that we need. We can claim our healing. We can claim our deliverance. We can claim um, uh, the, the regulation of our thoughts and our minds. If God lives in me, then I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a very blessed woman and you're a very blessed woman as well. And a very blessed man as well, because you have everything that you need. Thank you so much for joining me. I pray that something has been said or that you have been enlightened just a little bit more uh, by this word. And I am praying that God manifests God's self in you in great degrees on this week. I'm telling you, everywhere you go, God is with you. Erica, did you hear me? Helen, did you hear me? Naomi, did you hear me? Sandra, did I said, everywhere you go, God is. And that's a blessing. He says, if I ascend into the heavens, David, God is there. If I go into the lowest parts of hell, God is there with me. He's with you everywhere you go. Listen, if this message has been a blessing to you, certainly uh, you can sow into this uh, word. Just to say, listen, I thank you for um, sending this word to me today. I really needed it. And um, I pray that the Lord would give it back to you 100 fold. Listen, if you have not purchased your Faith Forward shirts, you need to go ahead and get these shirts. They're going for just $10 and um, you'll be blessed by them. You can put it on when we watch Faith Forward and we'll really be connected in the spirit. I personally touch and package and bless every one of these shirts that go out. So um, that is a blessing uh, to you. Listen, I love you. Have a great week. That is my prayer.